We're living in this very fast world where we feel really stressed, waking up thinking about work. We could even tell ourselves, this is how I am. The hardest thing to do is to notice it because there is an addictive element to this state. It's uncomfortable to slow down. On the level of the nervous system, we're able to shift our state, and in doing so, we often shift the story that we're telling in our mind. By working bottom-up through our nervous system, it can be four times easier than working top-down from our mind. That is the fascinating and magical thing about understanding your nervous system. It actually allows you to take back a level of autonomy over your experience of the world around you. Welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness, and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking, and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives, and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships, and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. And today I have a really beautiful conversation about something that I believe and I know underpins everything. Yeah, underpins everything we do, underpins our relationships, underpins how we perform in our career, underpins how we communicate, which we actually touch upon in the episode, which is really talking about our nervous system, uh, our, our breath, our nervous system, and nervous system regulation as well. And we get very deep into the um, the the kind of understanding of the nervous system, how it works, um, there's different branches and strands. And I have two wonderful men, um, on the podcast with me, James and Jamie. Um, Jamie, who's been on the podcast a number of times before, and James is a new guest. And they'll talk about what they do. They both work with the breath, but also they they are branching out and expanding into really helping us live life in a more connected to self and connected to other way of being, while being able to, uh, you know, be with our emotions and feelings and our experiences. In this episode, we talk, you know, we talk a fair bit about what the nervous system is. It's different part, bits and pieces, it's, it's basic workings and its function. Um, and we get you get a lot of detail about how that works in a very simple and easy way to understand. We also talk um, a good bit about how we can bring ourselves into regulation, the practices we can do both with breath and, and other things, um, goes into detail about that as well. And we talk about emotional integration or bringing up emotion, big feelings and emotions that we often experience and we do um, big breathwork experiences, you know, conscious connected breathing where we feel a lot of emotion, maybe emotion that's been trapped in the body that hasn't been processed. And we allow us, we talk about that and the, the positives and negatives of that, you know, how that can, uh, can do harm. And we talk a little bit about different breathwork and the nuance of how we should choose our breathwork based on our state and based on where our nervous system is at and the importance of doing that as well. And we finish up about the importance of pleasure and why pleasure is actually really beneficial to our nervous system and why connection is really beneficial to our nervous system as well. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff we talk about, including stress as well, stress and anxiety, because they're also really key pieces of this, this nervous system conversation. And I, as always, you know, it's such a pleasure to be able to have these conversations with men who are so knowledgeable and have such expertise in these areas, because I learn as well, right? So I am hope you're looking forward to this one. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say anything else. I'm gonna let you just jump into the episode. Welcome back, listeners. And I know that you love to learn about ways in which we can heal ourselves, help ourselves. But also, breath is always really popular on the on, on the on the podcast. People learning about how we can use breath to shift and change. And I have two wonderful guests here, two men who are absolute experts in this field. So I'm really looking forward to just listening and maybe asking the odd question here and letting them talk. Um, one one guest who you've heard 
number of times on this podcast and another guest who's very new to me, but I've really been enjoying a lot of what he talks about. It just feels, I love, I love the feel of his content. It just feels gentle. And I really want to touch on that, the power of the gentle breath, the gentle, slow and relaxing and easing breath. Cause I think there's a lot of power in that. And I've really been diving more and more into that myself as well. So today I have with me two men, Jamie, do you know? You probably know, you've had to heard him in a couple of different episodes. And we have James as well. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, really good, thanks. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. And um, yeah, grateful to be here. Yeah, likewise, I'm glad to be back. It's always a pleasure, as we were just saying before we came on air. It's always a pleasure to chat, man. And um, yeah, first time that James and I have have teamed up uh, for a podcast as well. So it's, yeah, nice to be in the ring together. We're We're good friends as well as, I suppose, kind of, broadly speaking colleagues in in this field um and so yeah really really happy to be here to to have this conversation all together mm, beautiful and I'll start with, with james actually because i haven't had you on a podcast episode and i'd love to hear what your journey was to to move into the work that you do now with breath and with nervous system yeah so i guess my journey into doing what i do now started more or less 10 years ago when um I developed a range of chronic health issues, um, started with, um, having glandular fever when I was sort of around 18 and glandular fever evolved into chronic fatigue. Um, I think most likely as a result of physically being quite malnourished, having had an eating disorder in my teens, um, and then also emotionally not being in a massively, um, what I would now label as sort of like organized and regulated state. Um, having experienced certain things in childhood and adolescence um, and all in all basically resulted in me being in a pretty um, disorganized state, which meant that when I got glandular fever, um, the dis-ease in my body could develop quite easily. And that then evolved into chronic fatigue and with the chronic fatigue came chronic pain. Um, and I didn't have chronic pain in all areas of my body at once, but the only area of my body that I haven't experienced chronic pain in is my head. Um, and at different points during those sort of years in my late teens, early twenties, had chronic pain in sort of, yeah, all the different areas of my body apart from my head, um, at different times. And it was when I went to go and see, um, sort of went down, I guess, like the conventional medical route to not much avail, went down the alternative medical route to some avail and, um, functional medicine and supporting my body, body physically was a really important factor in improving um, my health. But it wasn't until I went to go and see a specialist pain physio who specialized in pain management um, and told me that I needed to start a meditation practice and explained to me the relationship between the mind and the body and how effectively what I understood at the time um, to be a very anxious, fearful, worried mind was causing um, this reaction in my body. Um, and when he told me I need to start meditating and, um, he recommended a certain book by an American mindfulness teacher called John Kabat-Zinn. Um, I looked at him very quizzically and probably said something along the lines of, can you just give me a massage? Like I've got pain in my knee. Um, I really don't need to be going and doing meditation practice. But, um, basically because I was just experiencing so many symptoms and had them so long that um, I thought, you know, why not? I'll give it a go. And it didn't click straight away. I was definitely not a story of, um, you know, some people sort of like take to meditation like a duck to water and just sort of like go off swinging it, sw swimming in very peaceful and um, calm states. And that definitely wasn't me. Like it was, it was messy. It was difficult. It was hard. But I soon started to see that my mind was effectively in this pretty consistent and constant state of fear, um, specifically in relation to the symptoms I was experiencing. Um, but also I think as a result of, um, that being the sort of underlying conditioning of the way my mind had been perhaps shaped in sort of my formative years. Um, and as I started to settle my mind and specifically was able to see how, um, what was going on in my mind was creating this reaction in my body. Um, all of the pain started to dissipate and, and fade away. And it, and it quite literally did just fall away um, within a few months. And I haven't had chronic pain since. Um, and that was what, I guess, opened me up to the world of meditation. And then specifically that sort of field that um, is quite buzzy at the moment, it's sort of like mind-body disorders. Um, and that left me sort of 
down a path of becoming quite interested in Buddhism and going off on meditation retreats. And that was when I stumbled across breathwork um, and specifically a style of breathwork called Conscious Connected Breathing, um, which I'm sure we'll speak more to at some point. Um, but it's effectively a style of breathwork that works to um, process and clear what might be labeled as emotional charge or trauma from the body. Um, and I couldn't believe something as simple as the breath could have such a powerful and transformative effect upon the state of my mind and body. Um, so much so that I went down the path of, I guess, personally exploring that and getting a lot of personal benefit. And then the training came available. Um, and the same initial training that Jamie did actually, um, with a teacher called Alan Dolan. And that was, I guess, my journey into becoming a breathwork practitioner. Um, and then as my, my, as my, I guess, teaching journey has evolved, I've moved more from that style of breath work that's oriented around using the breath to process and clear emotional charge from the body more towards, um, a more gentle, um, nervous system oriented understanding of breath work that you slightly alluded to in, in your introduction. Um, and that's, we might speak to this more for everyone in the podcast, but that's, um, come about more because that's actually what I've found I've personally needed, needed and um, what I've resonated with as a result. And in doing so, I guess what my teaching has evolved into um, as that sort of reflected my personal practice and um, yeah, that nuance between that nuance of what style of breath work to practice and when dependent upon one's unique um, nervous system state and where they're at on their, um, their own journey. Um, yeah, sort of, I was thinking as I was saying that I'm going to try and keep this as short as possible and it always ends up going on. <laughs> Here's my life story. <laughs> it's hard to do, you know, it's a big question. It's a big question. And Jamie, I'd love to hear, you know, what got you, um, what brought you this far on your journey in, in, in the realms of breath work and, and nervous system, uh, and, and the yeah, nervous system. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. So, um, a lot of resonance with with what James shared there, and um, I will also do my best attempt at, at brevity. Um, for me, it came out of my own challenges with mental health, in particular anxiety, and in my early twenties, panic attacks, um, and really um, a state of hyper vigilance that was manifesting in in those panic attacks, and I got myself into traditional therapy, talk therapy, which has still played a, a very key role to this day in, in my journey and, and continues to do so. And um, at around the age of 24, 25, about six years ago now, just over six years ago, um, a little bit accidentally, ultimately, um, by coincidence, found myself in a, a breathwork session, which was Conscious Connected Breathwork that, that James mentioned. And very similarly found myself getting a huge amount of personal benefit from it whilst also starting to understand and apply breath work as a bit more of a um multifaceted beast that lies beyond just that realm of those deeper more therapeutic led practices um and seeing so much benefit that again um began to to learn more and and understand more from a, a teaching and a, a practitioner perspective and I'd say how that's developed, um, and I, I always love speaking to James about how his own teaching has developed because um, I certainly see mine having developed, but not necessarily in exactly the same way. So the way that that I have, I say chosen to go, but really felt drawn to explore has been very much through the lens, again, similar to James, of what has worked for me and what has given where I found the most value as an individual and um working across really this full range and spectrum of what breathwork can do in terms of um the day-to-day -day functionality of kind of respiratory physiology and i've really um immersed myself in that world of, of breath science and, and respiration recently um then the nervous system which i think ultimately forms a part of this spectrum but ultimately is the thing that underlies all of these kind of tools and, and practices that we're working with and helping people to establish a form of nervous system literacy that actually helps them then to be able to choose in an effective way the practices that will fit them um, and work for them at different times. And then I do still work with conscious connected breath work just because 
it has given me so much, continues to give me a lot. And I think plays a, a really powerful role that I think is going to continue to grow and evolve as more research comes out in this space from a, a therapeutic standpoint in terms of complexes, um, trauma, um, and the nervous system ultimately. So yeah, it's a little bit, I guess, around where it's come from and, and how it's evolved and developed over time. Um, but increasingly, and I think this is probably the, the biggest part of the Venn diagram between the two of us as practitioners is I found myself, especially in the last six months or so, paying so much attention to the concept of rest, so much attention to the concept of, of slowness and softness and gentleness alongside everything else. Because I think just so much of life itself and the majority, the, the vast majority of people that I see coming through my, my practice are suffering from some form of chronic stress, overwhelm, overactivation of the nervous system. Um, and so that restful piece, that gentleness piece, that organizational piece that James is, is speaking to um, is so key and so important as a, a bit of a counterbalance to the, the inevitable, it feels at times, intensity of, of modern life. Mm, thank you. Thank you, guys. And it, it feels really interesting that both of you came to Breathwork in a very conscious, connected way. And it seems like you're expanding your personal practice, your teaching to encompass, as Jamie put it, the, the kind of the slowness, a slowness, a gentleness to that. And I'd love to, I would love to get into that. But what I would love to ask first is you mentioned nervous system, both of you mentioned it. I mean, I think it's one of those mystical things that sometimes people think they have a grasp on and maybe they don't, they understand. So I'm going to ask that question is like, what is, what is the nervous system and what is its kind of basic workings and function? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very good question. And, uh, I, I, I sit here as someone who teaches breath work and puts themselves out as being relatively well studied on the nervous system, but I feel like my understanding of it continues to evolve every day. Um, and I guess to give a, to give a relatively simple, but also, um, detailed enough understanding of what the nervous system is, um, the way that I like to think about it is this, this automatic, um, this automatic process that happens in our body that, um, effectively works to maintain homeostatic balance. Um, so your nervous system governs everything that happens automatically in your body, whether that's your heart rate or digestion, regulation of your blood sugar, your breath, all part of your autonomic nervous system. And your nervous system is constantly on the lookout for either, uh, cues of safety or cues of danger in either your external or internal in environment. And depending upon what it finds, it will shift your autonomic state into becoming dominant in one of three states. Um, so the sort of old classical model of the autonomic nervous system is that depending upon whether your nervous system detects a cue of safety or a cue of danger, it will become either sympathetic or parasympathetic dominant. Um, so what that effectively means is that it will either be mobilized into a fight or flight response through the sympathetic branch of our nervous system, which a lot of people, and I'm sure a lot of listeners will have heard of, um, the classical, the classic sort of example that get, get, gets given is that if we were still hunter gatherers on a savannas thousands of years ago if a lion were to jump out from behind a tree the sympathetic branch of the nervous system gets activated we move into this highly mobilized state in which we secrete adrenaline and cortisol so we can either fight or flight from that lion conversely if your nervous system detects a cure safety then something called the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system is activated which it, within the old classical model of the nervous system is the sort of rest and digest branch of the nervous system. The reason that I sort of reference the old classical model is um, the lens that um, we like to teach through is um, polyvagal theory, um, which was developed in sort of mid 1990s by Dr. Stephen Porges. And what Stephen Porges found was that the parasympathetic nervous system actually has two branches. Um, one of those being what is commonly referred to as the social engagement system, which is the ventral vagus. Um, and the ventral vagus is effectively the branch of our nervous system, which we want to have an anchor in most of the time. When we are rooted or anchored in our ventral vagus, um, we tend to feel connected to ourselves 
but also specifically in relation to the ventral vagus, it's actually having a sense of connection to others and wanting to, um, I always say sort of wanting to be in the world. Um, so if you were to think back to a time whereby you felt safe, but also had that desire and longing within you to connect with others, that's you anchored in a state of ventral vagus. And when we're anchored in a state of ventral vagus, all of the autonomic functions that our autonomic nervous system governs, such as our heart rate, our digestion, the regulation of our blood sugar and our breath, all function in this very well-organized and optimal um, optimal way um, that could be referred to as uh, homeostatic balance. The other branch of the uh, um, parasympathetic that Dr. Stephen Porges found was um, something called the dorsal vagus, which is otherwise known as um, effectively our shutdown or immobilization response. And the dorsal vagus, you can think of as almost like the fuse switch to our nervous system. So when we experience stress and anxiety, what tends to happen is the sympathetic branch of our nervous system, the mobilization branch of our nervous system is activated. And if we can't find our way back into ventral or the charge is just simply too strong for our nervous system, but the nervous system tends to collapse and we fall into a state of uh, immobilization and shut down. And in that state, we tend to experience symptoms such as like lethargy, um, deep withdrawal from connection um, and depression um, and even symptoms such as chronic fatigue um, as effectively the system begins to shut down as a result of it simply not having the um, the bandwidth to process and be with um, the, the charge that is effectively running through one system. Um, so the reason why having that understanding can be really helpful is it effectively provides a little bit of a roadmap in relation to um, how one feels and why they feel the way they feel through the lens of the nervous system. Um, so one, if one is experiencing things like stress and anxiety, or if one is experiencing things like feeling shut down and withdrawn, then you can actually start to map um, your emotions through the nervous system and create a bit of a framework in relation to why you, why you feel the way you feel as a result of the way your nervous system is shaped. Um, and the reason why the breath then becomes such a wonderful tool in relation to being able to restore what we might refer to as ventral regulation is that it effectively provides you with um, a pathway through which to shape different branches of your nervous system or influence the different branches of your nervous system and in doing so um, find your way back into ventral. So... To give an example of that, if one is in a state of sympathetic arousal, um, whereby they're experiencing a lot of stress and anxiety, doing something simple like taking conscious control of the breath and slowing the breath down sends a signal to your nervous system that you're safe, and in doing so starts to downregulate your nervous system back into um, ventral regulation. And conversely, if one finds himself in a state of dorsal shutdown and wants to effectively bring a little bit of mobilization or activation back into their system to find their way back into ventral regulation, then one might use a breath that has slightly more activation to it or mobilization to it. So to bring some energy and charge back into your system and effectively fore out um, that shutdown response. Um, probably going to stop there because I feel like I've thrown quite a lot of like nervous system jargony words around. Um, and yeah, I just want to make sure that makes a little bit of sense um, before I say anything else. Mm. No, man, Lance. Um, it's it's like there's these two branches. One of them is, it, it sounds like uh, ventral vagal is where we want to kind of be spending our time, most of our time. Um, you know, connection to self and others. And I, and I love that because, you know, I work mainly around the sphere of kind of relationships and intimacy. And it's interesting that the, the, the connection to self and others, we wouldn't necessarily think of that initially when we think of like our general day-to-day -day way of being, you know, I imagine most people feeling like, oh, relaxed. Some people would probably feel like, oh, I don't really, I don't, I maybe feel like I'm an introvert or I'm not really a people person. I don't really feel like connecting with others. And then there's the, the, the kind of shutdown, which is like withdrawing from the world, shutting down, wanting to kind of, you know, wake up, waking up in the morning and not wanting to get out of bed. I imagine it's that sort of sensation of feeling that people are, are, are kind of experiencing having and, and having. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think for me, it was really helpful in relation to, um, I definitely have a tendency towards dorsal, um, and, and being in a slight shutdown response. Um, and 
maybe um, falling more into that sort of like thinking brain typology found it really helpful to sort of have a little bit of like a framework in relation to why I was feeling the way I felt and then also a little bit of a roadmap out of it um, in terms of then restoring a sense of regulation um, and how best to do that. Mm. Mm. So, uh, and this is a question that just come to me. It's like, so, you know, a lot of us are spending our time in work in places where we're kind of trying to communicate with people, we're having to like connect to people, whether that is, um, expressing ourselves, listening and understanding. So how does these three branches that you've, you've explained, how would this affect our ability to communicate, listen and understand the people we're coming across in our lives? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think the interesting thing from a nervous system perspective is the more organized the nervous system state one moves themselves into, the easier it becomes to um, connect and attune to others. Um, so if we sort of work almost like the, the fancy work, the fancy sort of uh, label that gets used within a nervous system world is bottom up. Um, and what that effectively means is working like from working from the bottom in working through the nervous system to shift one's um, psychological state. And if we can work through the nervous system to move one into the state of ventral vagus, which is effectively our social engagement system where we feel organized, connected to our, ourselves and have an ability to connect to others, then it becomes much easier to be in relationship with others and also um, engage with others socially too. Um, conversely, if you were to um, compare that to being in a state of either sympathetic arousal or dorsal shutdown, which are effectively our two states of dysregulation, um, then in a state of sympathetic arousal, um, we tend to be in the state of being quite adversarial. Um, there can be a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear in our system. And in that state, um, can potentially find it hard to connect to others and might come across in a slightly angry, slightly, um, adversarial way. Um, I often think of, um, <laughs> the way that sort of like politicians communicate in government is sort of like, a very nice epitomization of a lot of systems in sympathetic arousal. Um, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of um, jostling, a lot of um, communication that's done in a very adversarial way. And then conversely, if one to think of someone in state of dorsal shutdown, um, the image that comes to mind for, it, for me is me a lot of the time in my 20s where I was sort of in social situations, quite collapsed, um, feeling quite lethargic, like I can't really be bothered. I don't really care. Um, I just want to be on my own. Everyone else can piss off. Like I just, just, and, um, I know that the more organized the nervous system state I've moved myself into, um, the more I've actually wanted to be around others, connect with others and have found it easier to connect with others too. Um, and you know, as much as I'm very much in a position of um, teaching breath work and teaching stuff in the nervous system, I'm still very much on my own journey in terms of moving into a more organized nervous system state. And um, a reflection of that is that you know, a year ago, I moved down to Somerset um, and <laughs> really wanted nature and a lot of time on my own. And at times that still is wonderful. But the more I've sort of, I think, moved into a more organized state, the more I've wanted to connect with others, be around others to an extent where now I'm like, actually, I think I want to go back to London or at least be in somewhere where there are more people around me. So I have the ability to effectively give my system much more of what it wants, which is that social engagement. As a result, we're spending more time in that ventral vagus social engagement system. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And then my mind is like whirling because I'm thinking, again, I'm thinking from a state of relationship as you explain those, those different states mm -hmm. of like, okay, the, the politicians, that's where we're in an argument with our partner or our partner says something to us that could be innocuous. Like I love to talk about household chores, you know, because when you're in a relationship, household chores, you know, no one can get past those. Imagine even, you know, Don Cruises of the world still have to do some household chores sometimes. So it's like, why have you not emptied the dishwasher? And then suddenly that feels like an attack and I become a hostile politician, you know? And I'm like, why are you asking me this? I've been busy all day working hard. You know, that's that that sense that we we kind of come from in that moment. But I imagine, again, I bring this in the, into a place of kind of dating. It's like that could also be just someone asking you a very light question on a date about yourself and you suddenly feel this charge and you're like, oh, I feel defensive even in that moment. 
as as well. And whereas if we are kind of in that state of connecting to self and other, those moments feel like an opportunity for connection, an opportunity for curiosity with someone else and not, um, we don't experience them as some sort of threat or attack. Yeah, I think um, to jump in on that, there, there's something that, that I always come back to when I'm thinking about my own nervous system, but also speaking and teaching on, on this kind of realm, which is that ultimately your nervous system is defining the lens through which you view yourself and others and the world around you. And so exactly as you've described there, David, like if you are in that sympathetic arousal and someone says, you know, why haven't you emptied the dish- dishwasher? Your back is up, you're spiky, you're firing back. But if you're in a much more regulated, that more ventral vagus state, and you hear exactly the same thing spoken in exactly the same way, your response will be different. And I think that is the, the fascinating and magical thing about understanding your nervous system, working with your nervous system, because it actually allows you to take back a level of autonomy over your experience of the world around you by cleaning that lens and really understanding that lens. And also, and it's something I, I'm working with myself a lot at the moment, is this idea of acceptance too for the moments where you are spikier, the moments where you aren't able to regulate your response and going, oh, that's because, and again, it's that framework of understanding why I responded in a certain way, because we're never going to be perfect. We're never going to get this right every time in terms of something like communication. But it does also enable that self-compassion and that acceptance of understanding why I did respond in that way. Uh, And I think communication and listening is such a, a fascinating part of this intersection of self-regulation of the nervous system and also co-regulation the conversation going on between my nervous system and yours um and i think the more that you know politicians being the great example i've worked with a couple as well and i would love all of them to to have this understanding I, i'm sure they wouldn't want to but I, I would love all of them to have this understanding so that they're able just to have those opportunities for connection, those, those opportunities to reset and regulate in the moment to make better informed decisions. Yeah. And just to follow up on that from Jamie's point, the, the phrase that often gets banded around in the nervous system world and specifically through, um, the teachings of Deb Dana, um, and she's got a great book called anchored, um, is, um, state over story which is effectively this idea as Jamie's just very eloquently spoken to is that through working on the level of the nervous system and specifically changing um, which branches of our nervous system are most active at any given moment, we're able to shift our state. And in doing so by shifting our state, we often shift the story that we're telling in our mind. Um, Whereas more traditional um, top-down psychotherapeutic approaches would tend to work from the level of mind and story to try and shift one state. When we're using something like breath work and working through the nervous system, we're actually working bottom up um, to create that shift in our psychological state rather than working top down. Um, and one of the reasons that working bottom up through the nervous system and through the breath is so effective is because we have, um, four times more afferent neurons running from our nervous system to our brain, um, than efferent neurons that run from our brain to our nervous system. Um, so by working bottom up through our nervous system at times, it can be four times easier, um, or at least more effective um, than working top down from our mind to our nervous system. Mm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say there is that like, it's easier for us to shift how we're feeling in the moment, our state in the moment by using the body than it is by trying to think our way into a better state. Completely. And I definitely would add to that, but I think it's important that there is nuance in terms of i think there's quite a lot of stuff out there at the moment in terms of like you only need to work through your body and you just go through the body and through the nervous system and, and you don't need to end everything top down um i think both are important um and i have benefited enormously from psychotherapy and um exploring identity and self through a more sort of like top down approach but bottom up is um incredibly important and specifically in relation to shifting one state in the moment um in my experience anyway is much more effective than just going and trying and thinking one's way out of 
um, the emotional state that they find themselves in. Mm. Mm. So, you know, we're in the moment we can shift our, our, how we're feeling in the moment and the body is a really powerful vehicle for us to do that. The breath is a really powerful vehicle to do that. And I think it was Jamie that touched on, like we're living in this very fast world, right? Basically, I'm going to talk about myself now. We're living in this very fast world where we feel really stressed and we're having to do like work long hours, especially those of us who are um, entrepreneurs and business owners. And we like find ourselves always, maybe we can never, we can never stop thinking about our work, like waking up thinking about work, waking up in the middle of the night thinking about work. You know, maybe you're experiencing some of those things. And it almost feels like we feel quite almost stuck in this, in this way. You know, it comes to the weekend and maybe we get, lucky we get a Saturday off and we're still feeling a little edgy, you know, and this might be an experience, some of the listeners have experienced, maybe one of both of you or one of you have experienced and you're feeling this for long periods of time and it goes beyond just kind of in the moment state. It starts to feel like this is, we could even tell ourselves, this is how I am even, you know, I've met people who've told me that, oh, I'm just a stressed person (laughs) or I am just uh, an anxious person. Oh, I'm not, or I have a bit of a bugbear with people who tell me they're introverts because I feel like the power of that label goes well beyond um, someone told them that one time and they've just kind of held on to it. But so I guess the question I'm asking for myself and other listeners <laughs> is: we find ourselves in 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 a in a predominant state of of arousal, nervous system arousal. I think as you as you put it, James. And maybe we haven't even noticed. We just put a tribute to other things in our lives. What can we start to pay attention to, to, to know if that's something we've kind of, kind of sneaked ourselves into, um, as a kind of, um, normal way of, of feeling and being? That's question makes sense. For sure. Yeah. I think, um, it makes total sense. And it's something that I think from, first-hand experience in my own life and in so many people that I work with at the moment, particularly one-to-one, that is the overriding experience of life as it is right now. I think we could go deeper into that. I think there's been this counter action post COVID of we withdrew because we had to, everything slowed down. And then we have sprung back even worse than before into this like catch up mode of having to double down and get stuff done, stress, 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 move, move, move. We're going into high activation without much respite for a lot of people, particularly in cities. Um, and particularly in the, I think sort of that, again, it's a bit of a limiting label, but type A camp of people who are used to operating in that way. And as you alluded to there, David, I think it can be quite, um, subtle and insidious and there's a quote it's a, not a, a sexy quote by any means but a quote that i think i love here which is if you sit and shit for long enough it stops smelling and i think if you find yourself in this stressed activated state for long enough you don't even realize you're sat on the sofa you're watching tv you're quote unquote chilling but your nervous system is still in that high arousal state and you wonder why you can't switch off you wonder why you're waking up in the middle of the night you wonder why you know it's all consuming And often when we find ourselves in that state, the hardest thing to do, and this is where we get ourselves into challenge, is the hardest thing to do is to notice it because there is an addictive element to this state because it's uncomfortable to slow down when you are in that elevated state. But I think the first piece and the first step here is the listening, it's the observing, it's the the interoception the actual capacity to connect to the body and listen to what is going on. So what are, for you as an individual, the signs and symptoms of that high hyperarousal state where you are in that sort of dysregulated state? And that could be irritability, that could be spikiness when someone asks why you haven't unloaded the dishwasher, that could be physiological symptoms in terms of, one for me is that's always a telltale sign is mouth ulcers. I always get mouth ulcers as I, as I find myself in a slightly more activated state for an extended period. So we're all different and we'll, the, these symptoms will manifest and present in slightly different ways. But I think that for me has always been the first port of call is to be able to identify, acknowledge, and then accept the symptoms. 
And then it is the practices and the protocols that we put in place as to how do we actually go about remedying that. And breath is, you know, a fantastic place to start. And I think from a um, day-to-day perspective, it really is about beginning to bring in, introduce and integrate these down-regulating practices, these calming breath protocols at intervals throughout the day, pre-sleep, in the morning, just to really act as a, a counterbalance and, and, and balance the scales back in favor of that more ventral vagal activity. Um, and I think, as James beautifully described, that having that framework of those three primary polyvagal nervous system states is part of that awareness piece of going, oh, where am I right now? And the more awareness we can bring to it, the easier it then becomes to to put these practices and protocols in place. Um, yeah, James, I don't know if you had any more to add on that in terms of of practical interventions and, and pieces to put in place when you are finding yourself in that kind of overactivated um, high arousal state. Yeah, no, I think I mean um, super comprehensive in terms of what you said, and I think the thing that really resonates with me specifically in relation to having that. Um, that framework in relation to understanding um, for me personally, why I was experiencing what I was experiencing and, and then how to effectively shift my state. So to return to a place of French regulation. Um, the only other thing I think I would add is that um, something that's been really helpful for me is um, this understanding that the nervous system is constantly, um, it's constantly in relation to that, which is um, in your environment um, through um sort of fancy word that gets used as um, co-regulation. Um, we co-regulate with others um, in which our nervous system sort of tune um, to each other's in the unique you know, nervous system state, but we also co-regulate with, to the environments in which we're in. Um, and the reason why I mention that is that um, as one develops that um, skill that we mentioned in relation to interoception um, and developing an awareness and connection to their internal world and their um, the different flavors and tones of their nervous system states, one is able to become more attuned to how um, the environments in which they are in and specifically um, the environments in which they live, they work, and also the people they spend time with um, influence and shape their, um, their nervous system state. Um, so it can be brilliant and wonderful to have tools such as breathwork whereby we're able to self-regulate and return to a state of ventral regulation but it can also be really helpful to reflect on how we can create conditions in our life that support a more organized nervous system state so that we're not always having to um, rely upon a down-regulating breathwork practice at the end of the day, um, but actually are more easily able to maintain a more organized nervous system state as a result of creating conditions in our life whereby um, both our physical, emotional, and nervous system health um, are supported. Mm-hmm. So that's creating a life where... <clears throat> a life where we are well regulated so that would be you know and obviously we're always going to have some peaks and troughs just because of of life you know <clears throat> kind of need that but it's i'm hearing you say it's like creating relationships with people in our lives that those people we can co-regulate with and a, and a an environment that might be our working environment that might be the places that we go for walks or go for runs or even just the the, the physical spaces then we also find ourselves in that they have a I don't want to say positive, negative, but have a um, down-regulating or regulating effect upon us. Completely. Um, so I'm I'm doing a training at the moment in something called organic intelligence, which is a, a model that sort of sits within the world of semantic psychology. And they talk a the whole time about creating conditions. Um, and the more that we can create conditions that allow for more organized nervous system states, um, the more easily we're able to move through life without being sort of rocked into states of dysregulation. Um, and I think you know, it's probably a little bit cliche to say, but we're effectively trying to create conditions that our neurobiology um, is built for, which is living in closer connection to nature, living within sort of the um, one's natural sort of wake sleep cycles, following a circadian rhythm, having community. Um, and even speaking to um, something you mentioned earlier, David, in relation to um, having a slight skepticism in relation to when people say that they're introverted. Um, I was reading something the other day, I can't remember the name of the author, but she went to go and study um, a tribe somewhere in the world. And 
one of her key takeaways was that no one was introverted. And I just thought that was interesting from sort of like a nerve for a nervous system lens is like, if one is in an organized nervous system state as a result and as a result of living in conditions that support, um, that sort of, um, organismic resiliency or biological synchronicity, the sort of like fancy work phrases that get used, the extent to which then things like introversion or even any sort of like physical or emotional disease or ailment just sort of like slowly fades away as a result of effectively just living in a more inverted commas natural environment. I think it's, um, it's something I come up against a lot in, in my work, both as an individual on a personal practice level, but also working with others because as James alluded to, I think there's so much in, you know, this personal development and well-being culture and movement at the moment that is speaking to our natural rhythms, that is speaking to that um, connection to nature, connection to self, connection to natural rhythms. But it almost speaks also to the fact that particularly in cities, we'll take London as an example, because we've all lived here at one point or another. And I'm sure there are a lot of people tuning in who do live in London or a similar city, which is actually nothing about this environment is conducive to that. I, I would say that, you know, yes, there might be more people. So that might give a rise to that, that heightened sense of connection, but because of the overstimulating nature of it and that kind of dysregulating nature of it, that's why people in London aren't speaking to each other because there is that that kind of disconnect and nobody is really feeling necessarily that comfortable in that that connected to self and other state. And so that's where I really see the power of practices like breathwork and and these more, I suppose, directive balancing and regulating practices really having power and why also I think they've grown in popularity and notoriety is because they almost operate as a little bit of an antidote to the inevitability of an environment like London. And one thing that I certainly see is that it's only really through the lens of a regulated kind of connected state that we can ascertain what is best for us. So from, as James, you know, as you said, moving Somerset, might have felt like what you needed at the time and it's allowed you perhaps to to really deepen that sense of regulation and then see what of the rest of it you want to bring back into your life but i think so many of us end up on this treadmill and we're just on that that kind of activation continuously that it becomes very difficult to zoom out and get that perspective and get that state of regulation that allows you to really tune in and tap into your needs your wants and design those conditions and design that environment for for greater regulation as well um so i do think for people listening to this it is a i think it's a tough task as well in in modern times to to create those conditions and i don't think um we should downplay that mm. yeah yeah we live in a <laughs> i've seen an interesting um shift myself i was living in madeira uh for a couple of years and i recently i bought an aura ring probably around March last year, maybe March-ish last year. And as soon as I moved back to the UK, my resting heart rate went up 10%. <laughs> Literally days oh. and stayed there, stayed there. And it wasn't until uh, the turn of the year where I've been exercising more. I've been going to the gym a couple of times a week. I've been running once a week, usually, and yoga at least once or twice a week, that that started to to kind of dip back down. I've been paying more attention to getting to bed early. I've been doing heart coherence breath work in the morning when I wake up and also before I go to bed with, with my, with my partner, that it's actually gone back to what it was when I was living in the sunshine and I was, you know, able to look at the sea every morning when I woke up. And I found it really interesting because one day I just showed my, my, my partner also, and she was like, wow, that's how it's affected you moving back. And I was like, yeah. And all we did was you know, move from one country to the next. And where we are here in Margate is lovely. I'm just by the, I'm not far from the sea still. Obviously the weather's a bit different and the, the copious amounts of rain have shift, shifted. But it was really interesting just to see switching my environment. Nothing, nothing else really changed in my life, you know. You know, also we found out also was pregnant. Maybe that's also had an effect on my, <laughs> on my, on my mind and body. I imagine it definitely has. Um, but it's really interesting to see that just that like location shift had such, such a change on me physiologically um, as well. 
And I wanted to do you, go for it. Can I ask, do you have a hypothesis as to, as to like what that is in relation to the environment that has caused that shift? So like, is it the sun? Is it being back in a slightly more densely populated area? Or is, are you not sure? Mm. I am wonder if it's that I probably spend more time indoors now than mm. I did before. I probably spent a lot more time in the sun and I wouldn't necessarily say I was out a lot, but we had a balcony. So, you know, even if, you know, in the mornings I'd wake up and I would read and sit on my balcony and I would read and I would journal on the balcony. And it usually, it wasn't, it wasn't intensely sunny there, but the, it was clear and so forth. Um, and we also did a lot more uphill walking, which is a strange one because Madeira, if you've ever been, is very uphill or downhill. You never really do. So, and I think this, I think the heat, just being warmer, not really ever feeling cold at all. I wonder if that was also had an effect on me as well. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll move to Madeira. <laughs> <laughs> it's a place I definitely recommend. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned um, emotions before around the effect of our emotions on our um, our nervous system, or living in places where the emotional connection, emotional balance. And I've been I've been reading the presence process, and I've only just got through the first couple of chapters of listening to it. And it's talking about this concept of emotional integration, um, and it kind of goes in line with I've also been doing um, some e EMDR therapy as well. And my therapists often talk about emotional integration. And I wonder if either you'd like to talk about how you see emotional integration and its effect on the on the nervous system. <laughs> it was bound to happen at one point. Yeah, I can I can speak to that as James and I debate who's gonna who's gonna go first on this question. Um <laughs> I suppose um working with my understanding of emotional integration. Um, and perhaps this is where the definition is important and we might actually end up being speaking about co two completely different uh, definitions and interpretations. Um, my understanding of it really, I suppose, comes through the lens of conscious connected breath work and um, uh, on a personal level as well, kind of general um, work on an emotional level. And for me, it, it really comes through how we relate to our emotions, how we express our emotions, and I suppose the legacy and imprint of repressed or suppressed emotions and, and how we hold those in the body, in the nervous system, um, and how we can seek to process, integrate, and move, move through those. Um, I suppose speaking to, to conscious connected breath work, um, anyone who's ever experienced it, and I know you guys having both been on the side of the the facilitator and the, the participant will, will know that those experiences can be incredibly cathartic, um, often spoken about, not language that, that I particularly resonate with anymore, but as breathwork for emotional release. Um, others will speak to it in terms of breathwork for emotional integration, um, processing, whatever kind of language we want to put on it. And um, what we're often seeing in those experiences is a physical and emotional manifestation of the emotions that are held and stored within the body and in the nervous system. And through the breath, we're able to create this sort of open, receptive state um, and move ourselves into a state where that emotional charge can surface. It can actually, in some cases, sort of almost reactivate and take you into a state and an experience where you are able to then feel that in a way that um, is safe and contained in a way that perhaps wasn't previously for you. Um, and for me, that really, while it's a powerful, almost isolated experience in that case, it, it has a real sort of longer term impact in terms of that, that release of, of that residue and that gunk of that emotional charge that we are holding on to, um, but also speaks to just our relationship with our emotions day to day. And I think it really has allowed me and enabled me to have a greater understanding and greater emotional literacy in terms of just the expansiveness to the, the extent to which I'm able to feel my emotions without that desire to cut them off, to block them, to, to repress. And that has been 
invaluable for me and and I think it's a really key part of these deeper these deeper practices and experiences with breath work is connecting people who perhaps have cut themselves off from that full expression and and full uh, experience of their emotions to really tune back into that and find a a safe container and process through which to to move through those those feelings um so yeah a little bit of a i think a, a roundabout uh, answer but um that's what what came through for me the thing that i guess i would i would add to that and um yeah i really like what what jamie just said is um i do think that sort of that that word integration um is put out there quite a lot and i'm personally not sure that I, I think a lot of people mean a lot of different things when they say integration um what i know i first heard when i came across um the word integration i what i think a lot of people hear is or what a lot of people see is this sort of image of deep cathartic release sort of like processing and letting go whatever the body, body is holding on to um and as much as that can be um really helpful and supportive um, at various times during one's healing journey. Um, something that I think I overlooked and now probably prioritize in my teaching is actually establishing a relative level of safety and organization in the system first and creating that container before one perhaps goes and look, goes looking for sort of, I guess, the deeper emotional wounds or the emotions that haven't yet been felt and need to come up and be processed. Um, and sometimes I think with, um, I think probably as a result of lots of different things, but um, there seems to be a little bit of a tendency at the moment to sort of like want to go and like find all the really deep stuff and bring it up as quickly as possible. And then in almost like in the hope that in bringing up as quickly as possible, it will just sort of like fade away and all of um, our problems will just fade into the background and I can get on with my life. Um, that's definitely what I hoped when I first came across Breathwork. And as much as that stellar Breathwork was supportive for me, um, at first it, I definitely needed to establish more safety and organization in my system just to find a relative level of regulation and be able to move through my everyday life. And what I've also found is that as I have established more safety and organization in my system, those things that I thought I needed to sort of like bring up and deeply process have either sort of just like slowly dissipated or have just come up in a much more useful way as a result of there just being a sort of like baseline level of regulation in my system, um, rather than going looking for the deep cathartic piece and such. Yeah, I definitely mm. think it's a, a a symptom of that silver bullet, magic bullet self development culture of people looking. You even see it in the content around conscious connected breath work. You know, um, some of the more extreme, what I call catharsis porn that people put out on social media of these huge expansive releases that. I'm sure can entice some people, but also put a lot of other people off. Um, and I think do the the depth and the magic of those experiences a bit of a, a disservice ultimately, because mm. people come in expecting this huge emotional release that's going to cure all their problems. And they're left wondering why they're still human um, at the end of it. And I think um, I always remember, I, I experienced EMDR myself as well, similar to you, David. And I always remember that practitioner, uh, that therapist, um, emphasizing so um strongly the importance of the grounding breath work and the the grounding regulating work alongside the emdr because it is one of those practices where you are exploring those deeper depths of the psyche the self those deeper layers and so that's where you know even in my work today with conscious connected breath work there is such an emphasis on this other side of the coin which is the you know we can dig deep provided there is an existing basis of safety and regulation mm -hmm. and that there are also practices and tools and skills around the edge that allow you to self-regulate in the face of anything that might continue to to surface through that process and so i do think we can and i, I think this is probably where james and i again differ but certainly hold a lot of similarity in the middle as well you know there there are places for all of these practices but it very much takes nuance and it takes an understanding of the nervous system and understanding of the self to know what is appropriate for you at a given time and 
for a practitioner to be able to work with that as well um, and really empowering the individual to understand what they need, which again, to come back to a point I made earlier, only really comes from a, a state of regulation in the first place. Um, and so I do think the, the gentler approach is certainly the more long-term sustainable effective approach, but it, it isn't the one that people in a dysregulated state leap for because they are chasing that quicker fix. They're chasing that, that bigger release. Um, that doesn't tend to have the same longevity. Hmm. And I think just to follow up on that is it sort of comes back to that, um, which Jamie's I completely agree with and couldn't agree more with is that idea of um, breath work almost being prescribed on a bio individual level, dependent upon the state, the individual state that one finds himself in is that sort of where that framework of, um, having that sort of nervous system lens can be really helpful because if one is in a state of sympathetic arousal, practicing something like Wim Hof breathing, which is going to create more sympathetic activation in one system and potentially dysregulate one further, could be um, completely the wrong thing for one to practice. Um, whereas if one is in a relatively organized um, state and is anchored in ventral vagus, then using something like Wim Hof breathing to um, create a mild and acute stress response to increase hormesis could actually be a really beneficial thing for someone to be doing. Um, and that's where that sort of like nuanced approach that I think both Jamie and I resonate with, whereby there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong, but there are different styles of breath work that are appropriate to different people dependent upon their unique nervous system state and the state of their psyche and just where they're at physically as well, um, rather than giving the instruction that practitioners like Wim Hof do, which is literally just breathe. And it's not as simple as that because just breathe can dysregulate a lot of people um, dependent upon their nervous system state and what style of breath work they're then practicing. Um, and even the style of breath work that I tend to teach, which is um, more oriented around nervous system, nervous system down regulation, um, isn't always appropriate to use if one finds themselves in a state of dorsal shutdown, if there's very little energy in one system, if they're quite collapsed, if they're quite withdrawn, slowing the system down even more can actually just reinforce that shutdown. Um, and they actually might need something a little bit more activating, a little bit more mobilizing to bring some energy back into their system. Um, but that's where that sort of like almost piece around like um, the psychoeducation of the breath and teaching people the sort of nuances of breath work and how to teach it um, or at least practice it through a nervous system informed lens um, can be really helpful and ultimately keeps people first and foremost and most importantly safe um, but also ensures that ensures that they get the most benefit of um, the relevant practice that they're engaging in mm. and it feels like from what you are saying that the two of you are saying is like there's a these points of <clears throat> like safety and regulation and and even the the kind of integration, the catharsis is like there's like a there's a real link between these and our ability to actually get the most out of these areas or practices to help these areas that require it's almost as you as you put it it's like a real nuanced and personal kind of experience for that and just going towards the you know the big workshop um, breathwork release which which I laugh because partly. When I first did breath work, I had this massive experience of like letting go of grief and sadness. And then I find myself now when I regularly do like longer sessions on my own, or even if I do something in group, I don't have those big experiences really anymore. It's a lot more subtle. It's a lot more like, oh, I got this idea and there's this something just made sense to me and, and, and writing those down. And it's, it's, it's harder for us to almost believe that that's as valuable because it isn't such a big thing that occurs like, oh my God, I, I processed all that grief from my father not being good enough and being told that I wasn't good at running a hundred meters or whatever it may be. But I'm kind of hearing from the, the both of you and correct me if I'm wrong, that actually it's those really subtle moments, those subtle moments of safety, um, feeling safe in our body that allow the gentle experiences of pain and difficulty to arise. And, and because we feel safe, because we feel regulated, we're able to process those on our own in a very normal and kind of regular way. We don't need the big kind of breathwork release catharsis experience to kind of force us to experience those emotions because we've created a baseline that allows us to feel our emotions and be present and grounded while experiencing them. Yeah, I think um, 
a vision, I think you've hit the nail on the head, a visual that I had in my mind, similar to, to what you described there when I first came to Conscious Connected Breathwork was um, like there was a cork in the top of this heavily pressurized bottle just waiting to pop out. And so, of course, when I went into that experience, the cork pops out, everything sprays everywhere. There's a, bit, a big experience, a big release because I'd been pushing things down for so long. And so actually now that I do have that sort of nervous system literacy, that emotional literacy to, to understand and feel those things without them having such a strong affect, then um, you can ride that wave in a much more subtle way. So I, I, I definitely think that. And I think that's where, for me, Conscious Connected Breathwork as a personal practice has evolved. And now, yes, it can be used as a, an emotional integration tool, but it can also be used, and this is where I see the research and the future of this practice going as a um, a creative pursuit, as a insightful experience, not necessarily just on the level of the emotional, but at the the level of the subconscious, at the level of the that kind of um, more expansive altered state of consciousness piece. Um, whereas I think that's where the language can become a little bit limiting where if we're only speaking about breathwork for emotional release, because then it confines it to the realm of, of one piece and confines it to the realm of a defined experience as well. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with your, your take on that. And take a slightly different direction is like, we you know we talked a lot about using breath as a way to regulate the nervous system. And we see a lot of conversations in in the in the Instagram world of how healing, healing a nervous system, healing a nervous system. I'm getting the impression from what you guys have said because both of you have, you've you've not said the word healing. I've noticed, I've noticed. I don't know if that's deliberate or just like uh, um, something that's naturally come up. Is there other practices that we can use that you guys use with your clients in your retreats and your workshops that allow us to both regulate our nervous system, bring us down into the, I always think of rest and digest because I've listened to Jamie's YouTube video so many times. <laughs> it's stuck in my <laughs> mind. Um, but also to kind of expand, I'm thinking of like our window of tolerance. You know, sometimes some of us have a very small window of tolerance. Is there practices that we can use to kind of, what I'll call kind of expand or strengthen our, our nervous system as well? It may not be just breath. Yeah, so um, a really nice, a really nice practice um, for supporting a more organized nervous system state is um, orientation, which is effectively connecting to the environment through one senses. Um, so there's a sort of, um, I guess, conventional wisdom within. Um, I'm not going to use the word healing <laughs> you know, against what you just said um, within the sort of like healing space um, or at least the sort of, I guess, like more therapeutic space. Um, but to, um, but the first thing one needs to do is effectively bring their awareness into, uh, into their body and become aware of their um, emotions, sensations, feelings. Um, as much as this is important and interoception and interoceptive sensitivity is a really important skill to develop, um, if one has found themselves in quite a disorganized nervous system state for a long period of time, um, actually placing one's awareness internally into their body can be a really disorganizing experience in and of itself. Um, so if I were to use myself as an example, um, when I went and did my first sort of like Vipassana meditation retreats, rather than them being regulating and organizing experiences in which I came out of them feeling more coherent, balanced, and resilient, they were actually incredibly dysregulating. And as I went on um, more the personal retreats, um, the more dysregulated I became. Um, the reason for this is that now I understand is I was effectively with um, a lot of disorganizing information in my biology, um, a lot of emotions that were too much for me to tolerate, um, a lot of very uncomfortable sensations that were outside of my window of tolerance. And by being with them and by placing my awareness upon them, I was effectively reinforcing those um, states of disorganization rather than dissipating the intensity of them. If conversely, one is able to bring their awareness outside of themselves and connect to their environment through their senses, and this is predominantly done through seeing but also hearing, 
Um, one is able to effectively provide their nervous system with stabilizing information. Um, so if I look above my laptop screen now, I can see very fortunate being in English countryside, but I can see a horizon, I can see rolling hills. And what I'm effectively doing is giving my nervous system a cure safety. I'm telling my nervous system there's no threat in my immediate environment. And in doing so, my nervous system is able to um, move into a slightly more organized state. Um, the reason for me why orientation and connecting to my environment from my senses was also so powerful was that I experienced a lot of chronic health issues. Um, when someone tends to experience a lot of chronic health issues, their awareness tends to be drawn inwards and can be quite hypervigilant, um, continuously, continuously fixated upon effectively what is wrong in their system. By bringing my awareness outside of myself, I was effectively able to break that pattern um, and provide my system with stabilizing information that then um, supports a more organized nervous system state. Um, there is obviously nuance to this in that we do need to have an awareness of how we feel internally and it's important to develop our interoceptive sensitivity. But there is also something in relation to um, connecting to that which is um, in the here and now in our present environment and in doing so supporting um, or providing stabilizing information to our nervous system. The other thing just to layer on top of that is orientation to pleasure. Um, so again, I guess within the sort of like more therapeutic circles, there can be a sort of like a focus and an orientation towards what is wrong. Um, so like I'm going to get into my stuff. I'm going to like get into the uncomfortable. I'm going to be with really difficult emotions. Um, and I know that was definitely me sort of heading off from the past the meditation retreats when I was 24 in a horribly disorganized nervous system state. Um, but when we orient to pleasure and what that simply means is orienting to, um, healthy, non-addictive, non-intoxicant related human pleasure. So things like connection or even getting in a nice bath or even the taste of delicious food. Um, when we connect to what feels good and allow ourselves to effectively follow that impulse, we're supporting more organization in our nervous system. Um, and so orientation and then orientation to pleasure are two really nice um, foundational principles to think about when moving into a more organized nervous system state. I think the only thing I would add to that would be, um, I suppose, adding on to what James has said there, just around that, the disorganization that can come up as a result of just turning inwards, turning inwards, turning inwards is this um, very cognitive led realm of personal development at the moment which is um you know i used to describe it and i laugh now because i i was so proud of it um uh, a phrase that a friend of mine said on on my first podcast ever which was um getting a phd in my own mind and i was like yeah that that's that's what we're aiming for is is deep self understanding on the level of a phd because that's where the answers lie and actually that can just serve to take us further into that um particularly that dorsal kind of shutdown state which is very introspective very kind of inward and actually living you know there's this almost healing addiction at the moment which is um not integrated it's very just inward facing constantly um at the level of sometimes in the extreme kind of isolation and so i do think this balance between self-regulation self-awareness but also external stimuli pleasure connection with others i think it's so important to strike that balance and i don't think again this is where the nuance word comes comes through i i don't think we're nailing that from a um kind of cohesive well-being landscape right now i think we're we're placing a little too much onus on self and introspection and self-awareness um that can actually lead to to more distress for people ultimately and i love the you know to finish up i love the the focus on connection with others and creating you know almost looking this word authentic connection with others and experiencing the pleasure and enjoyment of life and like in, in and of themselves those two things are healing in and of themselves and and it's really beautiful that it's not all about getting into the shadow and the weeds and the difficult things but actually just simply placing our attention on connecting authentically to other people in our lives and around us and and enjoying the enjoyable you know the simple pleasures and enjoyments in life can bring um and i'm going to use the word healing 
to our, our, ourselves, our nervous systems and our, and our lives. Yeah. And just one last thing for me to just follow up on that is a really nice phrase or something I remind myself a lot of the time is organizing attention. Um, the idea being that like, what am I placing my awareness upon and to what extent is that either organizing or disorganizing my system? Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Ah, oh, well, man, thank you. Thank you for such a, a beautiful conversation. I have learned a ton. So I'm really, I'm looking forward to listening back through this. Like my um, understanding of the nervous system continues to evolve. And I feel lucky to have these wonderful conversations. And I'm sure the listeners are eager to know where they can hear more of your teachings, where the, they can work with either of you, both of you. You know, you must have, I know, like online programs coming through and retreats and so forth. So Please, I'd love you to tell the listeners what you thought coming up. Well, part of the reason we're doing this podcast together is that um, very excitingly, Jamie and I are um, releasing a breathwork course that we're hoping to launch in May, um, going to be called Breathwork Mastery, which is a um, five-week online course with um, both Jamie and I, which is effectively a, a deep dive into both the theory of um, breathwork, which will include all aspects of what we just talked about and more, um, but also to give people a really embodied understanding of breathwork in which um, we guide and introduce people to relevant practices um, under the spheres of sort of functional breathing, um, nervous system regulation, um, all states of consciousness, improving athletic performance. So a really broad and deep dive into different aspects of breathwork um, from both a theoretical and practical level. Um, and it will be with both Jamie and I, um, which is super exciting. Um, so yeah, if you... Um, like this conversation and want to learn more um with us then um yeah please do um come along to that we're hoping to open up applications at some point in march i'm not sure when this podcast will go out but um yeah keep an eye out for that fantastic fantastic man and all all the details will be in the show notes i'm sure to put the, the link to that in there as well so it's just to say thank you to both of you, thank you for a lovely, lovely, relaxing and easeful conversation as well um, between, the, between the three of us. And um, yeah, listeners, if you've enjoyed, head over to these guys' Instagrams. I've put the links in below and you can head over to the Breathwork Mastery and find out more about how you can learn to master your own breathwork your, and bring peace and ease and calm and regulation to your own nervous system as well. And with that, I say thank you, man. And thank you, listeners. Ciao, ciao. I want to say a big thank you for listening you know it's people like yourself that really help get the podcast out into the world you know especially if you're often sharing the episodes and the podcast with people that you, th you feel just could do with listening right can see a different way of being a man maybe a different way of having dating lives and intimacy and relationships so i want to say a big thank you and if maybe after listening to this episode you think oh there's someone actually who could really do with this please share it with them you know share the love I'm really really grateful and if you know you want to get in contact with me for any questions or you want to talk about coaching or any working together feel free to reach out to me on instagram at the authentic man underscore or you can email me hello at the authentic man.net thank you very much <laughs>